work out. Okay. <laughs> so, can you all hear me? Yes. Does the microphone work? <laughs> I'm scared of them. Um, well, I half feel like uh, skipping the lecture and, and going on to the cookies. Um, but um, I suppose uh, s some people might be disappointed. Um, I feel greatly privileged to, to, give, to give this lecture. First, because Andrew asked me to. And secondly, because it has been a great privilege to be among you all. And thirdly, because it is a privilege to be able to spout about everything I know. <laughs> and fourthly, because I live in hope, especially because of Eric, uh, I live in hope as well as uncertainty that there will be a future for Jewish studies and biblical studies and religious studies at the University of Alberta. And hope too for the university as a place of learning, imagination, and inquiry into all that matters. And a sense of pleasantness that I've been able to teach, think, and write for all these years in a space that society still affords reluctantly. <laughs> for that which cannot be measured or calculated. Understanding, wisdom, truth. I think of Moses on the plains of Moab and all those people listening. When will the, when will the old man stop? <laughs> but he doesn't stop. And his words reverberate through the generations in our book of Deuteronomy. And even when you think he does stop, he starts again, as if there is never enough to say. And after all the vituperation, the disappointment that he cannot enter the promised land, and his vision, his vision for the future and his foreboding, his reconstruction of his life, his sense of failure, his exhaustion, there is suddenly, finally, a poem of blessing. That is what I want to talk about. And then Moses doesn't have the last word. Not even God does. The Deuteronomist does. In the lovely, in the lovely last chapter of the Torah on Moses' death, and the writing is so perfect. Such an epitaph. But first I want to talk about other things. About teaching and research and the meaning of religious studies. If I had my time to do again, I would teach Religion 101. I would like to talk to students in a new way about how an understanding of religious traditions is essential to cultural liter literacy. But more important, I would talk about meaning. How people find meaning in the world. What it is to have a symbolic vocabulary <coughs> that is transmitted from generation to ge between generations and within communities. Because that is something I think is missing for many of our students. Hence the shallowness of the spiritual but not religious movement. I think I have become a good teacher. It has taken a long time. In a way, I always was a good teacher, but I became one. When I realized I had become a good teacher, I knew it was time to retire. <laughs> Though it took several years. I'm glad that teaching is still something experimental for me. Even this term, I've been trying new things. I always, or nearly always, prepare afresh each time. 
and discover things afresh. But there are things I repeat. I repeat that if there is anything I can teach, it is complexity. Students often like to have things packaged, memorable, simple. I cannot oblige. And it often tells in student evaluations. <laughs> and I dare not look at rate my professor. <laughs> Hence the danger of that kind of student report. Life is not simple, nor is the Bible, nor is the history of religions. The more you delve, the more difficult it becomes. In fact, students get it. I did a survey halfway through the term of the three most important, st the three most important things students have learned. And overwhelmingly, that they wrote about po the poetry, the value of close reading, the Bible as a book of questions, not answers. What I can teach is not knowing. The Lacanian critic Shoshana Fulman talks about teaching, like psychoanalysis, as an impossible profession, because one is always reaching the limits of one's knowledge. The student always draws one beyond oneself. What one teaches is a shared blindness. Students and colleagues who know me will recognize there the imprint of our dear departed friend, Robert Carroll, who wrote about the, the necessary blindness or blindsight in the vision of Isaiah. The text always means more than we can say. It resists our attempts at interpretation. It always has a surplus that is unknown or unknowable. But it always tells us something about ourselves that we do not know. I always like to quote my friend Gabriel Yosipovici in, in his book, The Book of God, who writes that we are drawn to books that matter because they seem to speak of ourselves but also because they are other than us. Because they guide us, quote, out of ourselves into what we feel to be a truer, more real world. Gabriel talks about writing and reading as a struggle with the angel who blesses us. <coughs> I've always loved Derrida. I decided not to take the package and to do a post-retirement contract because I'd long wanted to teach a course on Derrida and religion, but never dared to. I don't understand people, including some very dear to me, who loathe Derrida. What matters to me with Derrida is not that I understand him. It is the uncertainty. Derrida's favorite word is patetra, but perhaps. It is mine, too. My papers are littered with perhapses. <laughs> Derrida's sentences are sometimes horribly difficult to untangle because he loves to qualify them and then re-qualify and qualify them again and again to cover every possibility. I love the sensation of a mind at work. He writes as fast as he thinks, sparkling with doubt and internal debate. In our course on Derrida and religion, um, I don't think I did very well. <laughs> Perhaps those who were there, I only you know Michael, uh, who were there could, could tell me afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> what we did was read closely and carefully, sentence by sentence, in French and in English. 
trying to understand what, why Derrida chose this or that expression, what its precise nuance was. We were fortunate to have a fluent French speaker who can't be here. Uh, what it added to the discourse, where he was going on his adventure. For, for writing always is an adventure for Derrida. I don't think I could summarize Derrida on religion. We certainly, we certainly didn't read everything, or even a little. A summary, however, would be besides the point. Because Derrida is often about the inexhaustibility and exhaustion of writing and speaking. That there is no concluding summation. That great desire of Western philosophy. Hence, the fraught nomenclature, nomenclature of deconstruction. Taking apart the Tower of Babel, as in his great essay, Le Tour de, de Babel. My favorite, my favorite in any case, is his essay, Foi et Savoir, Faith and Knowledge, with its thesis that faith and knowledge, science and religion, are interdependent products of the Enlightenment. Religion, a word Derrida constantly interrogates, tracing its history, its bifurcated etymology, its Latin and Christian meanings, is both an agent in the, global, in the globalization of the West and Western technoscience, and resistant to it. Faith and knowledge, science and religion, diverge but originate in the same crisis, the same and repeated abyss, if you like, the crossroads between revelation in the desert, which leads ultimately to the promised land and what, uh, what Derrida calls the, 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 the messianic, and the desert within the desert, where there is nothing, and which Derrida identifies with Plato's concept of Cora in the Timaeus, the maternal spacing in which everything comes to be, but which is fundamentally passive, impassable, unaffected by everything. It is, as, it is as if Moses came to Mount Sinai and heard nothing. All religions, according to Derrida, construct themselves patriarchally over this abyss and render themselves immune to it, as well as to destructive forces from outside, such as other religions and death. Religions are thus self-destructive, or, using Derrida's metaphor, autoimmune. Violence with, without is internalized, since one can never be safe and sound enough. Hence the ambiguity of the sacred. A key term for Derrida, as for myself, the, the sacred designates both the safe and sound, a zone impervious to time and contingency, God's temples, communities, and the possibility of radical critique by prophets and revolutionaries in the name of a new order. The Bible, for me, tries to create a safe space a world with meaning, in which, we are, in which we are the chosen people. History is a, is a story with a shape and a determinate ending, and which covers over chaos and vacuity, the horror of exile and universal death. This is my Bible, why I find it so moving and fascinating. Is it loud enough? I have another love, Kabbalah. And I didn't take the, the passage, the package, because I wanted to teach Kabbalah once more, with all that I had learned since I had last done so. 
I have loved Kabbalah on and off since I bought Gershom Sholon's little book of Zohar selections nearly 50 years ago. And for the first time I realized that Judaism could be mystical and meaningful. Then I got Gershom Sholon's major trends in Jewish mysticism. Still the greatest book on Kabbalah, to which all others are footnotes. For a very young man, that was an adventure. Nowadays, I read some Kabbalah, Zohar, Shikatila, with the rabbis by Skype, intermittently, and I can't possibly understand it. I don't give myself time, but I've tried from time to time. I look back at the course last year, some students are here, uh, uh, and remember how lively the students were. Thank you. <coughs> Their, res their response made the course and made me aware of the responsibility, the capacity to respond of the instructor. <coughs> I am in no way a Kabbalist. I know very little. I am not a mystic. I know perhaps what it is like to be a Kabbalist and a mystic. To some extent I read Kabbalah as I read the Bible and anything trying to understand the minds of the, those who wrote them. I like it that for these people, as for Neoplatonists in general, and all pre-modern religious traditions I know of, what is truly real is mind. And God is a name for universal mind. That there is no distinction between self and other human and God, that imminence is assumed. It is nice to tell students that. I'll never forget our student and looks, surprised on hearing that Kabbalists believed in, in reincarnation. What I like and what I try to communicate is the complexity of Kabbalah. There is no such thing as simple Kabbalah, despite a book of that title, and despite the multitudes of books of pop, pop Kabbalah around. I am interested in Kabbalistic <coughs> experience, or if you like, mystical experience. But as something multifarious, I'm aware that the term experience and especially mystical experience, is contested. And my colleague Neil Dalal has written movingly about that. But I mean not just or primarily peak moments of Junior Mystica, the contentless, the contentless and unmediated contact with the ineffable, but something pervasive, almost ordinary. Kabbalah has to be learned, and it has taken 20 years or more to learn some of it. The experience may be one of exegesis, the immersion in Torah, which is the life of Judaism, but exegesis, exegesis as esoteric, as conveying deeper levels of meaning about the secret life of God or humanity. It is also, of course, a practice. Whether of the commandments as theurgic, communicative and contemplative rituals, or of anomian techniques for attaining power, entering trance, or performing magic. It may also be one of friendship. Jikatila was an intimate friend of Moses de Leon, a principal author of the Zohar, and a student of Abraham Abelafia. But I also like it that Kabbalah consists of castles in the air. It is an experience of the fantastic, of the medieval imaginaire, if you will, with its hugely elaborated system of sefirot and worlds, but also 
of the dissolution of the system into the infinite, into the nothingness that, according to Kabbalah, is the highest attribute of God. So all the words and worlds and interpretations fade into a pleroma of inaudible sound, the tip of the silent aleph at the beginning of language. I like that moment, the intimation of silence, emptiness, the imaginary world erased as in a Tibetan sand painting, what Paul Celan calls Atomwende, the turning of breath, and then the inexplicable impulse to speak, to write, what Derrida calls Vulwadir, that is the subject of Kabbalah. I've written about this, most recently in an essay for Ehud's Feshrit. And it takes me to the question of my research. People like to talk about the interdependence of teaching and research. But for me, at least, they require very different skills, activate different parts of the brain, more, more important for me are conference papers, usually written on planes, <laughs> mostly, mostly unpublished, which are adventures, sketches, in which I get some of my best ideas. I've really enjoyed, by the way, the papers I presented together with my student, Peter Sabo. And I want to say, Thank you, wherever you are. Oh. <laughs> Cain Yerbu, so, so may they multiply. <clears throat> Cain Yerbu. What matters to me in my research, as in teaching, is complexity. It annoys me no end when reviewers complain about the convolutions and complexity of my writing. <laughs> Like so many students, <laughs> so many scholars like simplicity. That is, why, that is perhaps why I have never been able to finish my book on Isaiah. I have fragments, torsos. I have no sense of the book as a whole, or even what it means to be a whole book, or for me to write a whole coherent book about a book which refuses to be a whole book. <laughs> despite the efforts of poets and redactors to make one. A book which is nonetheless obsessed with the idea of a book, the book of God, uh, the book of YHWH, I can't say it because of my name, uh, or the book to come, as Maurice Blanchot puts it, in which everything will be said. Absolutely nothing will be left out, as in Borges's story, The Aleph. And I somehow want my book to be that book, to say everything that needs to be said about the book of Isaiah and the book it prefigures. Of course, it is complicated by the difficulty of the poetic language and by the, dizzy, by the dizzying central paradox that it is a book that cannot and must not be understood that one only understands it when one does not understand it. Moreover, the boundaries of this discourse are arbitrary. There is nothing to say that a text should naturally belong to Isaiah rather than to Micah, to give the most proximate example. Or why so-called Deuto-Isaiah is attached to Proto-Isaiah rather than to Jeremiah. And yet, there are holes, enormous intricate structures and cycles that demand to be made sense of and resist that sense. It is, it, is, it is as if the whole book, and maybe the whole Bible, is constructed over a void, is an, inf is an infinite displacement of the death and exile at its heart 
is a displacement of that displacement, an attempt to insist on meaning because there is none. That, of course, is what attracts me to it and to the labor of reconstruction, say, in Persian period, Jerusalem, that is eventuated in our Bible. But I am not really a historian for whom the text is evidence of a certain literary history. I am interested in the processes of writing, the eros of writing, the love of language and the world, which is combined with a desire for knowledge and truth at whatever cost. It is that that I love in these texts and takes my breath away. Atemwende. And why do I undertake this immense, impossible task, especially now that I look back and forwards towards my own Mount Nebo, onto the past and the future? Aviva Zornberg, in her gorgeous commentary on the Book of Numbers, <coughs> Bewilderments, devotes the last chapter a kind of prequel to her forthcoming biography of Moses, to Deuteronomy. She talks about the paradox that the man who claims he cannot speak, that he is heavy of mouth and heavy of tongue, once he gets going, can't stop talking. <laughs> Deuteronomy is a long ap apologia for Moses' life, an attempt on the threshold of his death and the entrance to the Promised Land to make sense of his experience and to insist on his legacy. It is the most personal and most self-reflective of biblical books and a brilliant imaginative creation by the biblical author. I have always wanted to write about Deuteronomy, and never have. It is preoccupied, as I have already mentioned, by a sense of failure, bitterness, that he is not permitted to enter the promised land, that his life's dream is beyond him. This is, of course, a mystery. But, as Zornberg shows, the land is more than just a land. It is the object of desire for a perfect world. One that must be unattainable if we are to be human and to have a story. The leitmotiv of Deuteronomy, Zornberg comments, is the word avar, cross over. It is a book about crossings, from the familiar to the strange, from prehistory to history, from life to death, about being cross and being crossed, about transitions and metaphor. Moses dies because he cannot cross, because he cannot become ultimately other. But what he can teach is the imaginative propensity, the metaphorical capacity that makes us truly human. I have let you see it with your eyes, but there you will not cross over are God's last words to Moses. You can see it prospectively, imaginatively, but you cannot inhabit it, conquer it, and thereby betray it. Moses will always be our teacher, Moshe Rabbeinu, our teacher who lets us learn our lessons out of our own capacity, as the Talmud says. I have always identified with Moses, <coughs> in a way, uh, with the difficulty of speaking and writing and the necessity 
to speak and to write. Deuteronomy is a book about the bruises of life. One knows that this is a very old man speaking, who has suffered a lot, done a lot, and wonders whether it was worth it. But it is also a self-construction, a reconstruction through speaking and writing. Moses creates a second self, which he will leave for all generations. In terms of social memory studies, not my field, it is a future past. How the future will look at the past. But this is a self in process. Moses changes <coughs> through the act of writing. By the end, he is no longer the same as at the beginning. Uh, so at the end, after this is chapter 34, 33. So at the end, after all the laws, the blessings and the curses, and the long, grim poem in which Moses predicts Israel's perfidy, perdition, and recuperation, Moses finally comes to a blessing to a blessing over the tribes of Israel, matching Jacob's in Genesis 49. It is, however, a different Moses. He is Ish Ha Elohim, the man of God, a phrase never previously used in the Pentateuch, though frequently thereafter. The specification sets this text apart. This may be a different aspect of Moses, a different stage in his relationship to the deity. A man of God represents God, conveys a divine aura, but he is nonetheless a man, inescapably mortal. This is the blessing which Moses, the man of God, blessed Israel before his death. Notably, the one psalm attributed to Moses, Psalm 90, calls him the man of God and is a stark meditation on the evanescence of our lives and deeds. Even Moses dies. Even his life's work fades into history. Man of God is a synonym for prophet though it has somewhat broader connotations. This is how he is remembered, for instance, by Caleb in Joshua 14.6. Moses is already becoming a memory, a figure coming from another world, a divine emissary, and imparting blessing before he leaves it. The blessing itself is typically mangled by biblical critics. <laughs> and like its prototype in Jacob's blessing in Genesis 49, it asserts the unity of Israel despite its, uh, despite its diversity. Each tribe receives a blessing as part of the totality of Israel. Moses foresees Israel secure and prosperous in its land in language of extraordinary richness, virtuosity, and obscurity. As in Genesis 49, Joseph, the future center of the Northern Kingdom, receives a, an especially effusive blessing. However, whereas in Genesis 49, it corresponds to Judah, the future Southern Kingdom, here, its complement is Levi, the sacred tribe, and of course, Moses's. This leads us to think of Moses' self-representation in the poem, how he reflects on his life and legacy. The poem begins with a theophany, a manifestation of God, 
typical of ancient Hebrew poems, such as the Song of Deborah, Psalm 68, and Habakkuk's Prayer. Hardly one word is uncontested. Every translation is in part guesswork. Adonai ba misinai ba bazarach misay misayir lamo. Hafia meha paran. Fata me revot kodesh. Mi mi no eshtat lamo. Af chavev amim. Kol kodoshav biadecha. Vehem tuku leraklecha. Yisa mitabotecha. The Lord Yotevavhe came from Sinai. He shone or rose from Seir for them. He appeared radiant from Mount Paran and fared forth from the myriads of holiness. From his right hand, fire flashed for them. Indeed, he embraced his people. All his holy ones in your hand, and they are prostrate at your feet. One lifts up from your utterances. The Lord comes from Sinai. He shines forth from Seir. He is luminous in Mount Paran. All these places are associated with the wilderness, with the wilderness journeys. Moses is retracing his steps. Light and solar imagery combine. YHWH uh, rises in the southeast like the sun. Seir is the land of Edom or Esau. Jacob's inimical, inimical twin brother in the Negev and beyond the Dead Sea. The Lord is a desert God who comes from Sinai, the mountain of revelation of Moses' first encounter at the burning bush. What journey is this? It may be from the past to the future. The scene witnessed from the land of Canaan, a prospective retrospective, as it were. The Lord is a dazzling alterity, emerging like the sun from the uninhabited wasteland, beyond the horizon, a victor over or creature of chaos. He fares, fares forth from the myriads of holiness. Merivot Kodesh, a reference perhaps to Merivot Kodesh, where Moses struck the rock, another stop on the wilderness journey, or to the innumerable divine beings, an inchoate multitude from which the Lord comes on his path to becoming head of the pantheon or exclusive deity. This would be supported by the following. All his holy ones are in your hand. If the holy ones comprise the divine council and not Israel, and they are prostrate at your feet. Though uh, the translation is very uncertain. From his right hand, fire flashes. Another linguistic conundrum familiar imagery for the storm or warrior god evoking conquest. But he loves or embraces Chavev peoples, maybe an Israelite coalition, or perhaps all peoples, parallel to the Holy Ones. And they, or he, lift up or bear God's words. We have a transfer then from divine to human, from vision to speech, from third person to second person, from plural to singular. Above all, we have a story, God's story, from obscure beginnings to Israel's deity, from the divine desert mountain to the land of Israel. YHWH's story is matched by that of Moses 
in the next strophe. Torah Sivalanu Moshe, Morasha Kilat Yaakov, Vahibi Shur Melech, Piti Pit Asaif Rashi Am, Yachad Shifte Yisrael. Moses charged us with Torah, a heritage of the congregation of Jacob. And there was in Yeshurun a king. When the heads of the people assembled together, the tribes of Israel. This isn't uh, completely plain sailing either. But there is something remarkable, which I noticed in my very first course here, and which Rob with Nora might remember. In the first line, Torah Tziva Lanu Moshe, Moses charged us with Torah. The words for Moses, Moshe, and Torah are recombined to form Morasha, heritage, in verse, in line two. So you can see I have highlighted those. Four. Moses and Torah survive in and as the congregation of Jacob. The Torah is his extended personality. The same consonants, M, R, and Sh, are permutated in the next two lines. Yishurun Melech, there was in, in Yishurun a king, and Rashi Am, the heads of the people. The heritage of Moses and Torah is found in the ideal form of Israel as Yishurun, a rare poetic designation, meaning the straight one, an obvious transformation of Jacob's name and nature as the crooked one, the heel, the trickster. And then in the heads of the people, gathered together as united Israel, another alliterative metamorphosis. There is in Yeshurun a king, usually understood as the Lord, acclaimed in and presiding over a tribal assembly, and whose sovereignty was initiated by Moses. This may evoke the pre-monarchic era, ideologically or nostalgically con contrasting divine rule to that of the nations, or even refer to a human king, such as Saul or David, proclaimed in a national assembly and implicitly bearing the mantle of Moses. Anyway, we are at the end of the trajectory that began at Sinai. Israel imagined by Moses in its land, meeting to elect or under the auspices of a king, divine, human, or both. There is something odd here. Moses projects himself into a collective we, the totality of Israel, reciting the blessing and remembering himself. Moses charged us with Torah. He creates his own memory, his own future alter ego, from which he can look back on himself his life and his work. The blessings of the tribes follow, gathered notionally in United Israel, and we cannot follow them in detail. I will focus on the blessing of Levi because of its tantalizing biographical detail and touch on that for Joseph for personal reasons. Levi, as a sacred tribe, <coughs> where do this? This page is so much. Uh, Levi, as the sacred tribe, has no territory of its own. And so, not surprisingly, the blessing concentrates on its sacred function, 
since, as Deuteronomy says, the Lord is Levi's portion, literally territory. It begins, as one might expect, with the high priest, with the memory of Moses' brother, Aaron, and thus a displacement of Moses and his most profound traumas. Ola Levi Amar, Tomecha Vorecha, the Ish Hasidecha, Ashene Sito Pamasa, Terevenu Alme Mariva, Haume la Aviv Venemo, Lord Iti, Olechav Loikia, Ova Vanav Loyada, Kisham Rum in Ratecha, Itotecha in Sorrow. And to Levi he said, Your Tumim. And your Urim for the man of your devotion, whom you, te- whom you tested at Massah, tried at the waters of, of Meribah, who said of his father and mother, I have not seen him. And his brothers he did not recognize, and his sons he did not know. For they observed your sayings and preserve your covenant. So on the next slide. The Urim and the Tumim and Urim, usually in reverse order, Urim and Tumim, uh, are the oracles the high priest wears on the breastplate of judgment, next to his heart, and which represent the judgment of Israel. Aaron is uniquely described as the man of your devotion, Ish Chasidecha a rather imprecise epithet, but at least conveying a special relationship, loyalty or intensity. It is then surprising that it is followed by whom you tested at Massah, tried at the waters of Mariva. Massah or Mariva, testing and strife, is the place in Exodus 79 where Israel tried God in a classic instance of rebelliousness. In the parallel story in Numbers 20, it is called the waters of Meriva, as here. And there, Moses strikes instead of speaks to the rock, as God commanded, and is condemned to die outside the land, along with Aaron, who perishes immediately thereafter. It is a very puzzling episode. Moses' most painful memory. Why and how does he allude to it here? If it was a divine test, it is one that he failed. Why Aaron too was punished is is another question, another mystery. Moreover, it is juxtaposed with with another incident. Who said of his father and mother, I have not seen him. And his brothers he did not recognize. And his sons he did not know. This refers to the aftermath of the golden calf. When the Levites responded to Moses' call to kill each man, his brother, his friend, his relative. Levites are patricides, matricides, fratricides, and finicides. Yet Aaron is the primary sinner in the narrative, since he made the golden calf. And Moses is the principal example of the man who forgave his brother. They don't conform to type. It's a rather nasty type. Moses blesses Levi with smashing the loins of those who rise rise against him. Uh, At the end of the blessing, smashing the loins of those who rise against him. Guess guess where? (laughs) They are associated with sacred or sacrilegious violence, with putting incense up God's nose, with sacrifice. Moses, in striking the rock, is perhaps striking at God, for whom the rock is a familiar, meta, familiar metaphor, as well as the people. But there is something strange. Moses is charged 
with failing to sanctify the Lord, with not keeping faith. But in the very next verse in Numbers it says that YHWH was sanctified there. So perhaps the Lord is made holy precisely through not being made holy. Moses' failure is a success. Perhaps the the bond needs to be broken as mine is. I will pass over the blessing to Joseph quickly. Joseph is blessed with cosmic abundance, heaven and deep, sun and moon, ancient mountains, culminating in the favor of the dweller of in the bush, a reference to the burning bush where Moses' career originated. And I'll pass quickly over to Deuteronomy 34, the last chapter, noting only the fine edge between the ordinary and the wondrous, the uncertain future and the deep past, grief and eulogy, and the way the narrative finally circles back over the whole story. I have work to do. A work of thanks. Thank you to all my students, Ken, Peter, Ian, Ellen, Lauren, all of my students present and past. Thank you, Bob, Angie, Andrew, Peter, for making this event possible. Thank you, Bennett, for making, and Melody, nearly forgot Melody. Thank you, Melody and Bennett, for making cookies. <laughs> Thank you to all my colleagues and friends, academic, non academic, in this world and the next. And two very special thank yous. The first is to Ehud. We have spent nearly all our academic lives together. As I said to Ehud at his Feshrift dinner last week, opposition is true friendship. Opposition for the sake of the truth, for the sake of heaven, but also for opening so many doors, for being such a true colleague, not least with our collaboration with Munich, through which I've made so many friends, and through the editorship of the Journal of Hebrew Scriptures. And secondly, to my dear colleague, Willie Brown. I will miss you, Willie. For many years, we have taught our capstone course on method and theory in the study of religion. A course without method, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) Some of you will have taken it. Willie and I are totally different. He is a semi-Marxist materialist. (laughs) I am interested in the poetics of religion, of religious traditions. At times, we don't understand each other. But we get on. And students who took this course at least those open to it, gain something extraordinary and unfathomable. And so did we. So bless you, Willie. Thank you. And to my love, my true one, Bennett, it has been a lot of fun together, as you said last week in Atlanta. And it always will be. <laughs>